In this lesson, we're going to look at the national grid. The first aim is simply describe what the national grid is, then evaluate the costs and benefits of AC and DC as methods of transmitting electrical power, and then finally explain how transformers work. When I was 16, I remember watching the Euro 96 football tournament. It was a proud moment for the English team because they got to the semi-finals against Germany. The whole population stayed at home watching the event on TV. The match went to penalties and sadly we didn't win. But what happened next was quite interesting. Within about 20 minutes of us losing, there was a mass blackout. Loads of houses went dark as there was a failure to supply electricity to them. What caused this? Funny enough, it was a very British reason. What do British people like doing to calm themselves after a period of stress? Well, they like making tea. And to make tea, you need to boil water. And using a kettle to boil water uses a lot of energy. Electricity suppliers, maybe in a state of optimism, didn't account for this and didn't supply enough electricity. As a result, we all experienced a power failure. This highlights a point I think we take for granted. Our electricity demands vary over the year. Obviously in summer we're not in as much, we don't have to have the lights on as much. Whereas in winter, we're going to stay at home, watch TV more perhaps. Maybe over summer there might be the Olympics, so lots of people are at home watching TV. The point is, electricity suppliers need to account for variations over the year and predict our energy requirements, otherwise we can experience a blackout. The national grid has made it easy for us to supply energy according to demands. But what is the national grid? Quite simply, it's how we can supply an alternating current over long distances. You may have driven in the countryside and looked at these weird structures that look a bit like mini Eiffel Towers. They are in fact pylons, and they're connected by electrical cables. They are located all over Great Britain. So this is basically how it would work. You have your power station which generates your electrical power. Then the electrical power reaches a device called a step-up transformer. This boosts the voltage significantly. You can see here we're going from 25,000 volts to 400,000 volts. Now the electrons have enough energy to travel long distances. Next we actually enter the national grid, that network of pylons and cables. Towards the end of the journey, electricity reaches a step-down transformer. This significantly reduces the voltage all the way from 400,000 volts to 240 volts, much safer. And then the electricity is passed on to our homes where we can use it. But also shops and factories as well. You see, homes, shops and factories may have different energy demands. But that's okay, because it's alternating current, we can vary the output to meet variations in energy demands. The national grid system which transmits an alternating current to all our homes was championed by the scientist or physicist Nikola Tesla who I've already talked about in a previous tutorial. The first alternating current power station was set up in 1886 in the States. But what's so special about this? Well to really understand I think we have to compare it to what we had before. Thomas Edison fully backed the idea of direct current and when you put them next to each other you can see some glaring differences. For one, it was much harder to vary the output voltage. This meant you needed different cables supplying different locations with different voltages according to their needs. This was costly and not very efficient. Also, direct current power stations required much larger power cables. This was also very costly and led to an interesting knock-on effect. Thomas Edison set up his first direct current power station in 1882 in New York City. The aim was that when the sun sets in the evening, we don't have to remain in darkness, we flick a switch and a light comes on. But it came at a cost of daylight. Because of these thick cables situated above city dwellers' heads, a lot of sunlight was blocked, so the daytime was actually quite dark. I think that's quite a depressing thought. Also, lights at that time weren't particularly nice. They were called arc lights and they were incredibly bright, very harsh, certainly not ideal for romantic conditions. For this reason, many people still favoured candlelight. Also, direct current couldn't travel very far. There was simply too much heat loss due to resistance in the wires, which meant that a lot of that electrical power didn't get very far without running out of steam. As a result, Edison needed to set up power stations within every one or two kilometres from the previous one. Again, very costly. But Edison was ferociously stubborn. I think it's fair to say he hated Nikola Tesla, probably respected him on a level, but hated him. So much so that it led him to basically play a very underhand game. He tried to scare people away from alternating current, claiming it was incredibly dangerous. He said it was responsible for lots of animal deaths and human deaths. 
To prove his point, he actually electrocuted a live elephant using alternating current to show how dangerous it was. And he also paid someone to develop the electric chair to show how it can be used to kill people. Believe it or not, Thomas Edison was actually anti-capital punishment. It's amazing what a bitter rivalry can drive people to do. Undoubtedly, one of the most important things AC allowed us to do was use transformers. This meant that we did not need to set up power stations every one or two kilometres. Transformers help us by doing the following. If you remember how to calculate electrical power, it's current times voltage. This is the formula letter that you might see in those equation triangles. And this represents the unit, so watts, amps and volts. Now remember, what we want to do here is boost electrical power so it can travel further. Now this equation tells us we can do it in two ways. We can either increase current, which will increase power, or increase voltage. Because obviously if you make any one of these factors bigger, it's going to increase this figure here. However, there's an issue when we increase current. Yes, electrical power goes up, as your formula would tell us, but it causes the cables to overheat, so you get huge losses in electrical power as the electricity travels through the cables. However, if we use transformers to boost voltage and keep current low, then the overall power increases and we minimise heat loss. We still get some, but significantly less. So hopefully now you can describe the national grid. So we must be able to compare DC with AC. I'm just going to bring together what we've learned in the last slide. This can easily be a six mark question and has been. So remember, firstly, larger transmission cables means more expensive for DC, thinner cables are cheaper. Larger cables above our head block sunlight, but overhead cables are set up away from cities with AC in the countryside where it's not an issue. DC also offers less control over power output, whereas AC makes it easier to control output voltage due to transformers. But also, if you think about how alternate current is generated, you can spin that magnet faster, have more turns in your coil, and so on. If you've forgotten that, look at the tutorial on generating electricity. With DC, too much energy is wasted as heat, whereas less energy is wasted as heat with AC. More power stations are needed for long distance transmission with DC, but the national grid transmits power over long distances for AC. Transformers do not work with DC, but transformers work with AC. This means we can boost voltage without the need of a power station, but also when it comes to our homes, it's safer because we can drop the voltage as well. Although saying that, you didn't have very high voltages in DC, so it wasn't tremendously dangerous. A few negatives though for AC, potential danger near power lines, for example, you wouldn't want to fly any kites near here. Also, there have been suggested links with leukemia, cancer of the blood, but there's no strong evidence to support this yet. So you can see that the battle is clearly won by AC, and that's why most of the world relies on alternating current for delivery of electrical power. But it may surprise you to know that the last DC power station was decommissioned in the USA in 2007, not that long ago. So that is how you evaluate AC and DC as methods of transmitting electrical power. So I've spoken quite a lot about transformers, but what are these magical devices that give us command over electrical power? Well, they involve two components. The first component are two iron cores. And what we do is just bring them together to make a ring of iron. The next component you need are two wires. One you wrap around the first iron core and that's connected to your alternating current source. And the second one you wrap around your second iron core which distributes the power elsewhere. Now as you saw in the previous diagram of the national grid there are two types of transformers. Step up transformers and step down transformers. The difference between them is very easy to understand. Well firstly, step-up transformers boost voltage and step-down transformers reduce voltage. That's why you get these before the national grid and that's why you get these after the national grid. But what makes something a step-up transformer is simple. You just need more turns in the secondary coil than the primary coil, so it steps up. Whereas in a step-down transformer, you have more turns in the primary coil and less in the secondary coil, so it steps down. Now there's some maths you need to know to go along with these. Let's look at this one first. In such examples, you'll always be given three out of four components. One component you will not have the value for and you'll have to calculate it. The maths is simple, it's just a ratio. So in this example, you just need to see what we've done to the number of turns. Between the primary and secondary, we can see we've just doubled the number of turns. Therefore, we just double the voltage. 
So the answer is 20 volts. If we look at our step down transformer example, we are going from four turns to two turns, so we're halving the number of turns. Therefore, we just halve the voltage. So once again, we have 20 volts. So I hope you can see how easy that is. However, it can be a little bit more tricky. And we have to use this formula here. You'll find this at the front of your exam on your formula sheet. I've color coded it here so it all matches up. So this formula just says if you divide voltage across the primary coil by the voltage across the secondary coil, you will get the same figure as if you divided the number of turns in the primary coil by the number of turns in the secondary coil. In other words, the figure you get from this division is equal to the figure you would get from this division. Now you can rearrange this equation for convenience. For example, as long as you do the same to both sides, if it's easier for you, just put this down here and this up here and this down here and this up here and that works as well. You see if you're really finding it very difficult to answer a question try doing this, try flipping the equation and see if it's easier. But for now I've flipped them back. So the best thing to do is just practice a few questions. Let's start off with an easy question. It says a transformer has 120 turns on its primary coil and is supplied with a voltage of 230 volts. The secondary coil has 40 turns, so calculate the voltage across the secondary coil. If it helps, just draw a diagram and plug in the figures like I did above. Obviously you can't draw 120 coils here, but write 120 on the primary core and it might help. And as always, I recommend underlining the key components of this equation. So now substitute these figures into the equation above. Now because this is a ratio, I can assume because this figure is greater than this figure, that this figure will be greater than this figure. That's how you want it. You want the bigger values on top. It just makes it a bit easier. So I'm not going to flip the equation here because the bigger numbers are already on top. So remember, this divided by this will give me a figure. And that figure will be the same as this divided by this. So 120 divided by 40 is 3. In other words, 120 has been scaled down by 3 to get 40. So I just need to scale this down by 3 to get this figure here. So I'd have to do 230 divided by 3. So I just divide 230 by 3 and I'll get 76.7. Don't be put off by decimal figures, although generally they give you nice easy ones. Why don't you give this one a go by yourself before I give you the answer. A transformer has 400 volts across its primary coil and 50 volts across its secondary coil, which has 20 turns. How many turns in the primary coil? Once again, underline the key components and also label that diagram if it helps. So like before, we just plug in the values into this equation. Once you've done that, you'll get something that looks like this. Again, it's top heavy, so you don't need to rearrange anything. You can leave it as it is and perform the same calculation as before. Divide this figure by this figure. 400 divided by 50 gives you a step down value of 8. So whatever value this is, if you divide this mysterious value by 20 turns, you'll also get 8. So to get this value from this value, simply just multiply it by 8. So 20 times 8 is 160 turns. So the key thing to remember is whatever you do to this side, do the same to the other side. They scale up or scale down by the same factor. In other words, this value here is 8 times larger than this value, and this value here is 8 times larger than this value. So both these values have been scaled down by 8. Also, you should be able to tell from this that this is a step-down transformer because it has more turns on its primary coil than its secondary coil. So let's look at the final and toughest example. Well, potentially toughest, but actually there's a trick to it. A battery is supplying a transformer's primary coil with 9 volts. It has 520 turns on its primary coil and 6,000 turns on its secondary coil. Calculate the output voltage. This is actually a lot easier than it sounds. The only word you need to pay attention to here is battery. You see, a battery, like a solar cell, is a source of direct current. Transformers do not work with a direct current. So the output voltage, no matter what these values say, will always be zero. Look out for this, because they will try and sneak it into exams. But if you remember, you can very smugly put down zero volts. For transformers to work, you must have an alternating current. And that is how transformers work.